I'm Cindy Kelly uh, and I'm in Oak Ridge, Tennessee today. It is January 21, 2015 and I have with me Martin J. Skinner Sr. The first question I'm going to ask him though is to say his name and spell it. Really? Martin Skinner, M-A-R-T-I-N, last name Skinner, S-K-I-N-N-E-R. Terrific. Well, we are um, going to talk about who you are and how you happen to end up on the Manhattan Project. So why don't you start with uh, when you were born, your, your birth date. Well, and uh, I was born January the 9th of 1923 uh, in Michigan, just outside of Detroit. Uh, I went to the local high school. Uh, went after four years there. Uh, I went to Michigan State University as a chemical in chemical engineering. Uh, the fall of my sophomore year, I was, all of us were given an opportunity to join the enlisted reserve and stay in school. Well, I stayed in school three months, and the Army called me. I went through Induction Center in Chicago, Illinois, and from there I was sent to Shepherd Field, Texas. It's an Air Force base without any planes, or they had no planes at that time. They just had lots of dormitories with 100,000 people, mostly of Mexican descent. One of the days, uh, a few days after we got there, uh, one of the other fellows from Michigan State came running and said, there's a sign up on the, sheet, on the wall to sign up for additional education. And so all of us signed up. Well, they came and went and lots of people shipped out and nothing happened. And suddenly they put me on a bus and we went to I can't remember the little name of the town in Texas, right on the Louisiana border. And uh, from there, I was sent to LSU, Louisiana State University, as a student in the Army Specialized Training Program. Uh, I was there nine months, three three quarters of. of and then I was sent to Washington University, St. Louis, for the Advanced Army Specialized Training Program. Uh, we shipped out of there, and I trained, and the next morning we were in a city, I didn't know where it was. Uh, they put us in trucks with side, side curtains down. We couldn't see anything, drove us I, we stopped one time, which I think now was one of the guard gates of Oak Ridge, and then we went on to the Army encampment in, in Oak Ridge. Of course, at that, at that time it wasn't Oak Ridge. Uh, and uh, so from there on, I, I was assigned to work in one of the production buildings as an electrical mechanic. And our job was to keep all of the things with the Calutron going. And since I'm going to be talking about Calutron, now is, I think I'll tell you a little bit how Calutron operates. First of all, the name. The CAL comes from California. The U comes from University. The TRON comes from Cyclotron because the cyclotron at the University of California was where they demonstrated that they would be able to separate uranium-235 from 238, and 235 being the material they needed for the bomb. The cyclotron uh, uh, is uh, is a device which operates in an extremely High vacuum. There is a source unit here, 
and a receiver up here. In the source unit, vapors of the material you're going to separate are ionized by passing through an intense electron beam. They come out with applied voltages, and one of the nice things here is that this is in a magnetic field, and the ions, by physics, go in a circular path. One of the parameters that determines the radius of that circular path is the atomic weight. And since uranium 238H is slightly heavier than 235, it goes a little farther, and so at 180 degrees from the beginning, there is a separation. Not very much, but there is a separation. All of the material then can be taken out. The, the product is in a separate container at the receiver. It's processed to recover the material, and then uh, the process begins all over again. Looks rather simple, but here is a photograph of just the source unit. And these are, uh, you can see, uh, there's cooling lines, and there's heaters, and there's filaments, and electrodes, and all, and all of these have to be very exactly placed to get the beam to focus on the receiver. Anyway, that's how the Calutron is. But one of our, as I say, uh, my job, and I was on a shift with another GI, our job was to keep all of the units running in that part of the building. Uh, there were 36 Calutrons in the part of the building where, where we were assigned. And so there were 36 electrical cubicles, but each contained all the electrical equipment for a single calutron. One of the most frequent problems we had was that mercury vapor lamps, bulbs, uh, burned out. And they were positioned on top of a transformer inside the cubicle under a metal shield. It took time to take the bolt out that held the shield, replace the bulb, put the shield back in, put the bolts back in. You had to be careful that you didn't drop the bolts down behind the transformer or you had to go get another bolt. I devised a little clip that would hold this cover in place adequately. They could be just slipped off with a screwdriver or a pair of pliers. I submitted that as a process improvement, and I was awarded $75 for it. But then I got a notice from the Army that I couldn't be paid because I was in the Army. But that little clip is this, and my key to the, each cubicle is this. I've tried this key in another building and it doesn't work, so it must have been specifically for the building I was in. This is one of the filaments that uh, was illustrated in the other uh, photograph. We work, we work shift work there in Beta, what we call the Beta 1 building, the 9730, 9204-1, for about a year and a half. We're on rotating shift, uh, and uh, near the end of 1940, I, I went to Watchwell first in 1944, in September, I believe, and in late 1945, the government announced that they were going to discharge all of the Army people. And so they took us off active work in, in the buildings and put us to making all the 
alpha or first stage separators on standby. And this was that all, all we did was paint conduit, paint pipes, paint. And you painted as high as you could reach because there were no ladders. That's what got to be kind of boring, and so I heard that there was a possible opening in 9731 building, which was the pilot plant building. They had begun work on the separation of stable isotopes. And so uh, the two of us went over there and, and uh, met with the director, Dr. Chris Keim, and he, he hired us. Of course, that kind of made the Army people mad that we had stepped out of line, but that we were, knew we were going to get out of the Army anyway. So we went to work for him. And then uh, our dis discharge came about in March of uh, 46, I guess it was. Yes, March of 46. Uh, I went home for a week and then I was offered a job back in Oak Ridge doing the same thing as, a G as I had as a GI, but it's a civilian, it was civilian pay. I, so they were in the process of beginning the stable isotope separation research. One of the, uh, in, I guess it was in 47, the group was asked to enrich a sample that contained some uranium-236, a uranium isotope that doesn't exist in nature but is formed in a nuclear reactor. They had a sample and they wanted to have the 236 enriched so that they could, they could study its properties. And so about the time that I went back into the stable isotope group, uh, they were beginning that work. And we had a very small quantity, uh, something like uh, uh, 15 ounces of material to work with. And that was just two or three teaspoons full of material. And so we designed and built a half scale calutron, 12 inch radius instead of 24 as in the beta units. Because of the change of shape and size and everything, each part of it had to be essentially researched from the beginning. And finally, after testing the unit with, I believe it was bismuth, because it doesn't have an isotope, it was easy to follow the beam patterns, we finally began the production runs. And we recirculated the material through this special calutron eight times. The government had wished for material that had 15% or better of uranium-236. We started off with about 11 grams of material, ended up with a little over eight grams, but our material had over 22% uranium-236. We never did hear anything more from it, but that was the end of the project. One Monday, one Monday morning, Dr. Kime called me in and said, we're having a budget crunch. We've made up two lists. One is the list of people we cannot do without, and you're on the other list. But the good news is we've got a scheduled appointment for an interview right afternoon for another job in Y-12. So I went to, to the appointment, and it was a job to work in the law department of Union Carbide Oak Ridge to do patent work. I hardly knew how to spell patent, but you know, a job is a job. And so I said, well, I'll take it, and then I'll look and find a better job. Well, I stayed at it 30 years. And finally, in 1980, I retired from White Rock. It worked out. So tell us about, um, maybe you could go back to describing 
the calutrons a little bit. Um, some people may not know what a receiver is. Okay. Uh, it is just a receptacle into which the ion beam goes and is the uh, it's difficult to describe. Uh, the material is made out of normally made out of carbon graphite, and the incoming beam deposits on that, and then that is taken out, and the graphite is burned away at high temperature, leaving the material as deposited. And there, there are slits in the face of it to catch the various beams. There was one primarily for the 235, one for the 238, and the rest of the material just hits the face of it and is deposited. Nothing's, it can be taken off, but it has no value really. Uh, so there are slits to help define the edge of the beam because it's not very precise so that you get only the most concentrated portion of the beam in the center. If, a, if the atomic weights are significantly different, the space is more. If it's less, if there's only one uh, atomic weight different, they're much closer, and so there's more common combining of the material, and you get less purity. That's the best I can describe it. No, that's good. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, your tourists who come to visit uh, the Beta Three building for the first time. Can you uh, try to remember what you know a new person might have to know to well, take it in? After having worked in the Beta One for a year and a half, you know every crook and corner of the building. And when the, I had a chance to go through Beta Three the first time, I almost cried because everything was almost identical. It was actually as if I had gone back in, I don't know, umpteen years and, and, and reliving my life again. It was, it was a very strange feeling. So that was just a few years ago? When did you go back? I can't remember what year they opened. It was about five. It was in, uh, 2009, I think it was, that they had uh, Beta 3 open. And you were invited to come back? Well, it was on the, they had an open tour, uh, uh, like they had, had other years of, of 9731. Uh, it was the public was toured through the building, and and so uh, when I saw it, I, well, I got to go, you know. And uh, as I say, when I walked in the door, everything, you know, it, just a flashback, I guess is a better word, uh, of uh, years gone by. So what did you want to do first when you came in and saw this uh, machine that you had known so well? As a twenty-year-old or twenty-five-year-old, well, you just—I uh, followed with a tour. I, I tried this uh, cubicle key, for example, and it didn't fit in the one. So apparently, the they did, had different locks on that building. Uh, I might point out that because of the extremely high voltage, and some of the voltages were forty thousand volts negative, forty thousand volts positive. And this was DC. They had to, you had to be very careful, and so immediately inside the doors in the front of the cubicle, when you open, there was a grounding hook, and you had to, there were places in the cu uh, cubicle where you touch it to dis discharge any residual 
electrical charge. Uh, and so, uh, as an electrical mechanic, uh, we had to get into the cub cubicle to do the repair, so we all carried the key, uh, just like you carry keys now to, uh, to go into a workplace. So there was a strong magnetic force, right? In yes, the, yes. And here you have a metal key. Wasn't that a problem? As long as you stayed outside of the... Uh, they had marked on the floor with a red line a spot where you sh that you should stay out of with any metal. My, in my job, I had rarely had any need to go to the Calutron itself. I was back in the cubicle room by itself. So that was not a problem with me. But occasionally people wandered in there with a watch or some other piece of metal, and it was immediately destroyed. Would it just kind of be pulled off the person's wrist? What happened? It, it possibly could be, but it, it, it just demolished the insides of them. I see. Wow. So at the cubicle, are you, um, you describe uh, your job. What did you have to do at the cubicle? Well, they were running 24 hours a day as long as there was charge material going. And they were operators, mostly ladies, who continuously monitored, monitored the performance of the calutron. And they would call us when there was some aberration of that. And we had to diagnose what was causing that and then solve it. Well, as I say, most of them were failure of a piece of equipment like the tubes in, in the power sources. Uh, but after a while you just knew it was, when this happened, you knew what was going wrong. So you went to the cubicle, opened it up, went in and there wasn't much space inside. Hefty people couldn't have worked in there. Uh, and, and you went in and did whatever is necessary after you put the grounding hook in place. And then you come back and then you close up the doors and the, the operator start up the operation again. And hopefully everything was working all right. So you were a troubleshooter? Troubleshooter, yep. That, that's, a good, that's a good term for it. And the buddy of mine, we we claimed that we were the best crew in the building, and it got to a point where, if the engineering department wanted to modify the circuits in any way or do anything with the system, they gave us the job to install the first one to see if it worked, and. Uh, it was a nice feeling to feel that you were recognized to, to do that. Uh, so most you mentioned that most of the operators were were girls. Yeah. Uh, how did they do? How did the girls do as operators? Ac girls actually are more patient than men. Men wanted to jerk and. Hurt. And the women were able to slowly change conditions and watching the output meter to get the optimal operation of a girl. Most of these were just high school girls, or just out of high school, very young. And uh, we had uh, no air, there was no air conditioning in the building. And with all this, heavy electrical equipment and the magnet and everything, the buildings got very warm in the summertime. We had lots of fans on stands and, and uh, 
wore short sleeve shirts and they, you know rolled up well, long sleeve shirts or, or rolled up your shirt to, uh, to get to keep cool. Did the girls complain? I don't recall what they did. You know, I, my relationship with them wasn't such that I would that they would have complained to me. Uh, they would. Either, they were supervisors on the, uh, uh, there to, to help with major problems, and they would have gone to them for if, they, if they had a problem. But so, so I don't know. Did you um, notice that they talked to each other while they were doing this, or are they sitting there eight hours a day quietly fiddling with knobs? They were very good to stay attentive to their job. And I'm sure there was chatter going on, you know, but uh, not like in uh, uh, the type of, uh, like an office where, you know, they would have been uh, gabbing at each other all the time. But they were real, very dedicated people. So how long was a shift? An eight-hour shift. And then we were rotating, so we were on midnight shift and day shift and afternoon. You rotated as well. Yep. And people who we were working with, very few of them knew we were in the Army because on the job we were using company clothing. And a uh, fellow I was very close with, I bumped him to, in downtown Oak Ridge one day and I was in uniform. He was amazed because he didn't know I was in the Army. So. You were in downtown Oak Ridge or Knoxville? Oak Ridge. Really? So you wore your uniform when you were downtown, but yeah. not on the workplace? Uh, whenever, whenever you were away from Y-12, you were in Army clothes. I see. And they provided uh, blue clothes much like they use today in Y-12. You say blue clothes? Yeah. A d dark, dark blue? Were they like a jumpsuit or what? They no, they were regular shirt and trousers, but they were just a medium blue color. And that's what everybody wore? Everybody wore it. And what did the girls wear? They wore a similar thing. Blue? Blue with, uh, in, in jeans and, and a shirt. Hmm. So they looked like men. Well, the pants and their. <laughs> I've seen pictures of the Calutron girls, and they have some of them saddle shoes. Well, right? do you remember you know, that? I I don't remember yeah, that, but remember. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that there was. Well, I I was wearing army shoes because I was all the other clothes. I changed it going in and going out, so I didn't ever notice that. You suppose people knew you were in the army from your shoes? Not really. I mean, you can't. You can't tell. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't that unique. One person. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Huh. Um, so, did it take a lot of training for you to figure out how these uh, things worked? Well, we were given about a two-week training on a dummy cubicle. But most of it was learning by the seat of your pants, so to speak. I mean, you saw a problem and you could see what was causing the problem just by the nature of the problem. And, and after a while, things came to a second nature to you. Did you have a means of sharing your solutions with other troubleshooters who may be serving other shifts? Not that I know of. Uh, I mean, we just showed up, re replaced the people who were there before us and took over, and, and they would tell you if there was a continuing problem. And we had one group ahead of us that always found a problem just before they left. And they were 
renowned in the place of that being their characteristic. So uh, we always had to get on behind them because they almost always had an unsolved problem. That's funny. I think it's like that in in all businesses. I mean, uh, uh, there are people like that. And uh, so, how many calutron? Can you describe this whole arrangement? So you had alphas and betas okay. and so forth. Uh, the alpha building calutron were larger. They had a. 48 inch radius beam and they had four beams per calutron. Uh, in some of the alpha buildings there were two of the, the so-called tracks arrangement of, uh, of uh, calutrons and I, I got, got the information this morning I've already forgotten how many calutrons there were per track in alpha. In beta, each of the beta buildings, and they were, let's say, backing up, there were five alpha buildings. One of them had one track, and the others all had two tracks. In beta, there were four buildings that were equipped. Each of those had uh, 72, had two tracks, with 36 units per track, so 72 separators per building. The beta carriage had a 24 inch radius. As I say, the special one we built was 12 inch radius. So alpha comes before beta alphabetically, but mm -hmm. which came first when you built them? Well, well the product, the material was first processed in the Alpha buildings. And I can't remember, the, the concentration was raised up to something like 15%, uranium-235. Then that product then went through the beta process to, to get to bomb grade uranium. Can you describe how it, it started? You know there were the four well, I guess three uh, separation processes that eventually were used in sequence. Can you describe that? You know, starting with S50 and then the K2. Well, I, I, other, than, other than the gaseous diffusion, I really didn't, had no contact at all with any of the separation things. And uh, uh, I had very little contact with people uh, in the gaseous diffusion because, again, you don't talk with other people about your work. And so uh, uh, there was no real sharing of information. Uh, Did you? So you knew about the the alpha and the betas, though. Yeah. You you were, you understood all that happened at Y twelve. Pretty, pretty much so, because uh, the equipment was so similar, and I presume that they had electrical mechanics in the alpha buildings. They would have to have, but I don't know how many they had or how they worked. So, and I really didn't know what was going on in the other, I was only responsible for one half of a beta building. So I only had 36 separator and cubicles to, monitor, to help service. I didn't really know what was going on in the other half of the building. So there wasn't a common lunch place. You kind of ate at your station or something. Well, you, you went to the uh, cafeteria in my trail. But everybody was pretty uh, strict about not talking about the um, job. You, I'm sure you've seen some of the signs that were around everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, if people were found uh, to have uh, talked out of turn, uh, they were no longer there the next day. Do you have a sense there were spies embedded in the workforce, people who were reporting? How did, how did the, the officials know? I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I, expect, I expected that there may have been uh, people who were given the task of uh, 
monitoring that, but I don't know. So apparently you kept your mouth shut. Yep. So I'm here, still here today. So here. That's good. <laughs> Were you given security lectures from time to time just to reinforce this? We were at the beginning uh, when we were doing through a couple of weeks of uh, permanent training. Uh, it was beat into our heads. I mean, you could, uh, at the end of the day, you could quote every warning that we had read, had all day long. And then, of course, these big signs all over uh, the area. Were there many newcomers? Was there a lot of turnover and and uh, at least the girls at the who are assigned to the Calutrons or, or your uh, counterparts? They didn't appear to be in the Army people. Of course, we we were only active about a year and a half in, in the Calutron business. Uh, and, and I don't, they was occasionally new uh, Calutron cubicle girl. But most of them were there from the time I arrived to the time I left. So if you had 36 uh, units that you're responsible for, was there one girl per unit? No, generally, a girl had two units. Uh, when, a, when a system was running properly, there was not much to do except watch the meters. And so, uh, Arrange, the cubicles were arranged, they were set up two by two by two. And so uh, uh, a girl could monitor the pair that she was assigned to very well. So could you predict who was going to be the best at this? Was, or were there consistently high performers and middle performers? And I, I, I expect that, that the supervisors were watching that, uh, but you know, it was yeah. something that I wasn't aware of at all. Yeah. So, did you see these same women uh, off duty? You might run into them in the, you know, possibly, but most of them bust in from cities way out, you know, an hour or more distance. So they, most of them, came, many of them came in my bus from. Uh, Clinton, uh, Oliver Springs, and Lake City, and uh, Sweetwater, uh, and, uh, all around. There's uh, some places up in Kentucky. Uh, so you you didn't. There was no way you would run into them off the job. Where did you live? Uh, initially, in what we called Hutment, there were four people in it. Was sort of. A, wooden tent uh, with a central uh, oil-burning furnace and four cots and four foot lockers. Uh, later on, they moved us into one of the dormitories in the west end of Oak Ridge, and we had a, a dormitory-type room. So that was a big step up. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, it, it was the extent of the, the availability of restrooms. Uh, when we were in the Hutman, so there was one uh, central building where you went to take a shower and, and whatever, and and you walked on a wooden sidewalk uh, between buildings and going to uh, the washroom. So when we got into the dormitory, you had a lot more uh, camaraderie with more than just the four people of your uh, Hutman. Uh, there was always a bridge game going, uh, poker games were going, people would come and go, and, and players would change, but the, the game would continue all day and night sometimes. Uh, we, we had Army PX, we could purchase things at the discount, just like any other Army PX. And we uh, uh, were able to get things that some of our friends and family at home did, were not able to get. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, get batteries for my mother-in-law's hearing aid. Uh, so they were not available where she was, but I could get them, so I, I sh uh, shipped her batteries for her hearing aid. And, uh, 
So were you married at the time? When I was in the Army, no. Uh, and uh, I married when, uh, shortly after I was out of, the, out of the Army and had worked back in Oak Ridge for just a few months. Uh, I left in June of 40, huh, 46. And went back to Michigan. Uh, we were married. Uh, I'd known this gal since we were three years old. Her father was a minister in our church, and our families had always been very close. And I guess everybody th knew that we were going to get married someday. And uh, so we were married in, in August of 46. Uh, she was a teacher, and I rode back in Michigan State, so we moved for initially into a little town nearby uh, the college, and she taught in that school. Uh, then uh, I got my, uh, finished getting my bachelor's degree, and then I stayed another year and got my master's in electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. Uh, she moved, on, we moved to uh, married housing on the campus and she uh, worked in the chemistry department, uh, assisted with some of the uh, uh, setting up labs and things like that. Uh, uh, graduated then in uh, end of May or early June of '48, and, and then we moved back down to Oak Ridge again, going back to the same job I had been doing when I was uh, in the army. So you went back to the same, same. I uh, went to Oak Ridge, but was your what was your job? What did you I do? I was back in the into the stabilizer drug separation people, right? okay. and that's when we got on the the special uranium two thirty six project. What was that about? Well, it it was the one where we had to enrich the material in uranium two thirty six, and the, uh, the beginning material was less than one percent. And we enriched it over 20 per, or about 22 percent uh, using the special okay, the half scales okay, trying. And uh, about that time, uh, uh, I helped design uh, this equipment that was actually hung on the wall uh, in the uh, uh, 9731 when I was there. To, uh, basically, I think it was my idea, uh, but uh, I worked with George Wells, and we designed what we wanted, and, and the engineering people did, took it from there and put it into actual being, and uh, uh, to, so that uh, the, the operation of the Kelly Garden could be visually seen by tours. Oh, interesting. Huh. And it worked pretty well? Yes, and it still exists. Oh my! It's it's in uh, uh, beta three now. Oh, heaven's sake! And and that operated until, or at least some of beta three operated until nineteen ninety eight. Is that right? I guess so. I had left. I had left by that time, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I don't know the timing. But uh, in fact, when I was there, they were not using any of beta three. All of that came later, uh, after I left the department. Hmm. So, what happened after the war with, with all the calutrons? Well, there was an immediate rush to get rid of everything. And uh, went to salvage. Uh, a few people, uh, uh, Leon Love and, and Wes Savage and and Dr. Keim uh, were able to salvage what they could from being destroyed. Everything except beta-3, for some reason or other, it was not touched. Uh, it's just like it was during the war days. Uh, the alpha portion of 9731, all that remains are the magnets, all the other equipment was taken out. But they were able to save most of the beta equipment in the pilot plant. 
In the pilot plant building. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, is that where you were trained? You, you said you had two weeks of training. No, I, I don't know. I don't remember where we were. We were off in a warehouse someplace. I you got in the bus and the bus would take you there and the bus would pick you up and take you back. So what was a pilot plant used for then? Well, it was used to deter, to develop the fine process conditions for the, the production carriage that were being built. That was the initial, that was the main reason it was built, so that they could determine voltages and spacing and all the operating conditions. And the, part of the, this is I say, it's the, the mystery, the miracle, because they were building the production buildings and building the pilot plant and none of them had operated yet and yet they were able to build them and they worked. And it, it, that is truly a miracle in my mind. So it was from the theory they figured out how it ought to function. Right, and the, the work that they did at the University of California on the cyclotron, they did develop some of the fundam fundamentals. But to scale that up to production size, it, in my mind, is, is a miracle. I mean, to, to do it and have it work. You don't, yeah. You certainly so, don't hear about wasted. Uh, uh, on the tours, when people come through the the pilot plant, I tell them this is not only a Manhattan project, but it's a miracle project. We couldn't do it again. There's no way it can be done again. Things have changed so much in. Our life, we would not be able to keep the secrets that we were kept. We would not be able to get the money and proceed as quickly as, as it was done then. Are there other things that have changed? What what made it so special? How How could it be that you were so much smarter than the people today? Or More diligence, I think. Harder work. Unfortunately, we're able to get the money to do it. So, what motivated you? Why were you so diligent? Really, didn't know what I was doing or what I was doing it for, but I knew it had something to do with. War effort, and so instead of being put on active duty in Germany or wherever it might be, I had the opportunity to work there to solve and, uh, what the problem that they were trying to solve. And uh, if if we hadn't gotten that uranium at the time we did, in my estimation. The invasion of Japan would have already started. We would not have been able to use the bomb because our people would be on the ground. And the war might have ended entirely differently. I'm a strong believer in that. People ask me, oh, well, aren't you ashamed to have worked on something that blows up people? And I said, no. I th at the time, it was the most important thing that needed to be done. And I still feel that way. That's why I'm so anxious to have the park develop while I'm still on this earth. Because I want other people to know it. And, want, and why, in the things that I've given to Ray Smith, is trying to educate people. I want, when they leave here, have a touring. I want them to know what we did, how we did it, so it won't be a bit big mystery. 
Now, how are people going to come away from this story about how you succeeded in doing something that we probably couldn't do today? It's pretty awesome. It is. And, and there's no way for you to explain it, but it's a gut feeling, I guess, that I have that, uh, that if we can educate the people and educate them as to what the atomic age really brought to the world, not just the bomb, but all the other things that have come, it's, it's, it's big, probably the biggest thing that's ever happened in, in recent time in the world. So all these years, 70 years since the um, first atomic bombs, just a small percentage of people have really known much about it. That's right. And, and there'll be, year by year, there will be fewer and fewer of those people. And one of these days, the Board's Manhattan Project will be gone if we don't do something about it right now. I mean, there are not many people left like me. So, um, there are, there's a lot of interest in the national park by people in Japan. They're very curious and they're very worried that somehow the park will tell the story in a way that that won't be very sensitive to how they feel about it or how, so well, how do you that's, answer That's this? something that needs to be considered very strongly because we, need, we don't want to alienate anybody. There are some people you'll never convince that it was a good thing. Even a lot of scientists, you know, afterwards said we shouldn't have ever done this. But we need it. the park needs to show it, show the side of it that has benefited the world. Nuclear power, nuclear medicine, uh, just umpteen things uh, that. Have, we likely would have not had, at least at the time we got them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's something that really needs to be shown. And that's why I want these exhibits to show what we did, how we did it, and what the results were. And, uh, I propose some posters, or what you want to call them, that show radioisotopes, how they're formed, what they're used for. Uh, and, and what they're going to see is, you know, they need to see what, when they come to Oak Ridge, they need to see what they're going to see if they go to Los Alamos. They need to see what they're going to go to Hanford. So there needs to be some of that here just last time of Y-12, Oak Ridge has to be in those places. So people have an interest in going to see the rest of the park. That's a great idea. What, um, what are some of the most important things that people should know about the Manhattan Project? Well, I guess they need to know all of the things that were accomplished by the Manhattan Project and and the results of it. So how would you characterize all those accomplishments? Why was it a miracle? Well, you have to go back to the beginning. If, if we had not gotten the bomb, nuclear program pro probably would have died at that point. So the miracle is that we were able to do all these things on the bomb side in such a short period of time with so much equipment 
but it had to be constructed, and we were successful. And I, other than that, I don't know how to answer your question. So do you think, um, what role did the Army play, industry, the individual workers, how, how, how would you credit, or, you know, what factors do you think were responsible for making this all work, or people? Well, I guess you have to go back to the initial decision of pursuing um, making a bomb, and most of those were a mixture of scientists and politicians. And then the Army was given the job of, at least in Oak Ridge, of seeing that the, the things were done. Uh, General Groves and others. Uh, and, uh, and we not, we not only had some Army people here in White Trail, but we had some Navy people as well who were working in, in White Trail. Uh, whether there are any other service people, I don't know, but I knew of the Navy as well as the Army people. And, and the uh, freshman engineering detachment uh, was a, a part of the Corps of Engineers. So. But, it, it, you know, again, the people who needed to make the decisions made the decisions. They apparently relied enough on technical people that, yes, this is a possibility, yes, let's go for it. So you mentioned uh, the origin of the name Calutron comes from University of California. Um, what role did were you aware of that other universities played? Well. Of course, the first graphite reactor was the University of Chicago, and, and there was some up east things that I really don't know about. Uh, and I, actually, working in Y12 at the time, I was not aware of anything else that had been going on because it was all secret. So was there speculation in the hutman or the dormitory? What are we doing? Oh, yeah, always was. And I, I am told that if you went to the library and got out some chemistry books, the pages just flopped open to uranium. I don't know that, but I mean, that's one of the tales. And some, some of the chemists, I think, probably had a better feel for it than other people because they were having, because the chemistry was unique to to uranium, and so they they may have had a better feel for it than us electrical engineers. So how did you um, react when you found out on August sixth that this was how we? Uh yeah, the result well, of all this. Work. I first heard of it, if I recall correctly, uh, our immediate supervisor called us over in the corner of uh, of the building and said, told us about the the, the uh, test bomb in Nevada, and uh, uh, then of course, of course, Holmes was, wasn't very long after that. The bomb was actually dropped. And so, you know, everybody knew that. So you you learned about the the test in July of 1945. It's at, in in the desert of New Mexico. Is that yeah, right? New, they, yeah, New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, they told you that. They told you about the test. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Because that was did they tell you it was plutonium? No, they in fact. I had always, over the years, I had always thought it was uranium from Y-12. And so not too long ago I read, I guess it was a sort of 
of that video, they said it was plutonium. And I, I questioned Bill Wilcox and others about it. Said, Is that right? And they said, yeah, yeah. I, no, I thought it was uranium from, from R-12. That was the first bomb, the first test. So it would be interesting for you to see what this park says about what was going on in Very much, Los Alamos. Because and I, I've just heard smidgens of things. Uh, we, we drove through Hanford, my wife and I, some uh, 10, 12 years ago, and we didn't stop and do any touring, and I'm not sure there were tours available at that time, but I could see the buildings off in the distance, that's all I know about Hanford, and I've never seen anything in, um, out west. But when you go back in that building, it feels like it was yesterday? Mm hmm Very much so. I mean, everything is the same place. The equipment all, all looks the same. You know, you just feel transported back. It's a strange feeling. Well, that's really neat. So... Let's pretend I'm I'm a tourist. One, I'm Sally. Okay. You know, Bill Wilcox always talked about Sally and Joe from Peoria. Okay. All right, I'm Sally. Okay. So tell me, tell me about what did you do here? <clears throat> what is this big machine? All right. Well, I'll describe the two buildings I know about, and I'm sure that when it's all set up, they will be viewed probably in, in the, a certain order, and that is the, the pilot plant building and then the production building, but I don't know that. But as people come in to the pilot plant building, to the left they will immediately see the magnets from the alpha portion of the pilot plant with some pictures and, and drawings, I guess, of the depict the Alpha buildings that are no longer there. And then they proceed to the other end of the building and there they will see the beta portion of the pilot plant with all of the equipment. And they tell me that they will put a unit just like this at the museum in front of the uh, vacuum tanks in, in the beta part of the building. And again, with pictures and diagrams of, of what the parts are and have them explained, there will be a, in fact, I guess it's now in existence, a small theater in that building where there will be a, a movie going continuously as long as there are people in the building. So you need somebody along to point out these things, but those are the things you would see in 9731. When you go to the production building, 9204-3, you come in a lower level, and I, get, I don't know how they're gonna get people up to the operating level when it was before they used the freight elevator. And you come out right in the middle of the building on one side is one set of kyotrons, and on the other side is the other, 36 in each batch. You, you, the tour will take you past those and show you the components of the, of the kyotron that exists at the track. They will take them in then to the control room and show them the, the cubicles. I've recommended that the side, metal side be taken off one of them and plastic put there so people can see the inside of this building, like inside the cubicles, and explain, generally speaking, they don't need to go into a great deal of the technology, or, but there's a power supply that was for such and such, and there was a power supply for such and such, and, and here's the control, here are the controls on the front of the the door, and there will be exhibits around showing 
the big tubes that are there for the rectifier tubes, and and there would be this uh, this unit, to, again giving a living demonstration of functioning Calutron. And that's what I think people will see if they come on the tour. Okay. So is there anything that um, you think that you could tell them about this experience or about what they're looking at that would, would uh, give them you know, some insight, some idea about it that um, they shouldn't miss? I really don't know, uh, other than if people might got feeling of uh, how I feel about the whole project, you know, and, and it's, uh, I shouldn't say it's the main thing in my life, but it's close to me, the main thing in my life. I mean, although it happened all those years ago, being back on these tours has been regenerated my interests. So for the, let's say, uh, over 60 years in which you weren't part of the tours and you had left the project, um, did you give a lot of thought to your involvement in creating the bomb? Or I guess only when I was asked by people who, when I, when I knew that I had worked in Oak Ridge, when I was asked, you know, good or bad or whatever, uh, a lot of the electrical equipment I was working with were electrical relays to operate this and that contacts that you had to do in certain sequence to make things happen. When I went back to college, one of my courses was exactly that sort of thing. And I got A, a plus on everything because it was exactly what I'd been doing. You know, draw this up, draw, draw how this relay works and has, how this has to close before this one happens. So, and then I was on a speaker's bureau and I only called on once. And I went to Upper Peninsula of Michigan in February, and snow everywhere, and ice everywhere, and cold everywhere. Talk, talk to a Rotary Club or some organization like that about my experiences. That was the only time I had been called upon to speak from out of a Speaker's Bureau. Uh, it got up to zero that day when I was up there. <laughs> you were a brave soul. That's part of it's interesting that, that you weren't called upon very often then to talk about the Manhattan Project. Did people not know that you were involved? Well, probably not. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it takes certain conditions to to communicate that to somebody else. You know, and conversation has to be. Uh, but this last about a year, over less than a year ago, my wife and I cruised to the Hawaiian Islands. And they announced that there was going to be a gathering of all military people, servicemen. And I went to that. And people around the room told what they had done and where they'd been and all those things. And so I gave my spiel. And going out, I had two people pat me on the back and say, Thank you. The following day, I bumped into another one, one of the people who had been there, and he said, thank you. He had been in Vietnam, so he didn't know World War II as, as such, but he knew of the bomb. 
I have a brother-in-law who was on a ship in the Pacific going over there for the invasion. He tells everybody I saved his life. You know, did I? I don't guess so. And on one of the tours, I think this last year, no, it was in Smokies. I was at the mill in Cades Cove. And for some reason, uh, oh, I got to tell people I was from Oak Ridge, or Oak Ridge area. And that led from talking about it. And the man's father was same situation. His, his father had been on the ship in the Pacific when the bomb was dropped. So he thanked me, thanked me, thanked me. I had one of my doctors say, I wouldn't be here today because you saved my dad's life. You know, it makes, makes, makes you feel good. It makes you think that all, it was all worthwhile. So that's why it's built in me. I want to preach Manhattan Project and anywhere I can. As I said earlier, it's necessary, positively, absolutely necessary, that Beta 3 be in the tour. And you say it's, it's going to be. Thank you. You've made my day. Well, as you say, there's nothing like having something real that conveys what that project was about. Yeah. You get, you got to see the immensity of it. And with K-25 gone, there's nothing else that shows that. But when you walk into that building and say, that was built in a year? That's a miracle. Have you, did you go down to the basement where they have crates of uh, spare parts? No, but there were, there were a few up, uh, up uh, just outside of the, the control room. Uh, I don't think our tour took it. We went immediately up onto the operating floor. Can you tell what, um, tell the camera what the stenciled words were? You know, the name, it wasn't Oak Ridge, it was... Oh, it was the Clinton Engineering Works. Uh, I had my, one of my aunts was going to send me something and and uh, the postmaster in Michigan didn't know where it was. She ended up by saying it was near Knoxville. Well, I, I got it. So what can you tell us about Knoxville in terms of its importance to Oak Ridge during the war? Well, I think... I got the impression that Knoxville presented the work going on because it was taking everybody's money. They were spending it here and not coming to going to Knoxville. Uh, everything was interrupted by having all this government work going. Uh, yet, you know. Uh, Many of the churches changed. Uh, people, young people's groups met. Uh, Knoxville and Oak, and Oak Ridge. Uh, so it, it wasn't everywhere. I think it was the older population that resented. And maybe I got the wrong impression, but that's the way I feel. Um, yet, We'd go in there and we'd hitchhike. Never have to wait more than two or three cars before somebody pick you up. Take you any place you want to go. On our off weekends, we went to the Smokies often. And we'd get on the, our, the corner by the LN station, put out your thumb. You were in Gatlinburg. Uh, the hotels gave you a special rate. They gave us a nice packed lunch. We'd get on the road, 
put out your thumb, it'll take you up, up, up in the mountains any place you want to go. When you get ready to come back, you get on the road. It, it was, it was uh, you know, we were we were treated very, very well by the by now, were you in uniform when you were hitchhiking? So people knew you were military, or? What we, yeah, we, we were wearing in, uh, work clothes. And work clothes? Yeah. So they knew you worked at the project? No. Uh, no? I'm trying, uh, my, my terminology won't come to me this morning. But uh, uh, like fatigues, fatigues. That, that identified you as service. It showed me as military. I mean, right. you had a hat on. And right. Right. It wasn't just you were a young, handsome guy. No. In they, their they, minds, they, they, they you knew, were that plus They the knew we were military. Yes. They knew we were military. Yes. And uh, yeah. it wasn't the camouflage type of uniforms you, they use today. It was just plain khaki. So it sounds you t you took advantage of the opportunities to uh, go hiking and oh yes and uh, and uh, say you go up there and uh, you get off Friday afternoon you didn't have to go to work till the next Monday morning and uh, so uh, and later on uh, one of the fellows had a car and sometimes we'd go up to the mountains in the car but that was our principal outside. Relaxation. Uh, lots of people played. They played ball and they played all sorts of things. I, I played on the basketball team. Uh, we called ourselves the little stinkers. We never won a game, uh, but we had a lot of fun. I played a little softball. wasn't very good at it. I uh, wasn't good at the basketball either. Uh, I'd played football in high school, but there wasn't. I, oh, I guess there were some touch games. But the biggest thing was poker games and, and bridge games going just around the clock. Did they play for money? Uh, not, not normally. I don't think it was because people came kept coming and going, and there'd be no way to re mm -hmm. really. Uh, uh, one of my close buddies, the Hotman, and the Hotman with me. Uh, he'd go down to the PX and he'd cut cut cards for for money, and he was very successful. He sent home a lot of money, and uh, you know, different people have different habits or, or customs. What do you want to call it? So, um, lots of people talk about social life at uh, Oak Ridge, uh, but maybe you were sort of. Not part of that because you're. I, I wasn't on. because uh, I'm I'm not a party going guy. I guess, uh, and when I was off, I was usually in bed taking a nap or sleeping. Uh, I, uh, I didn't play poker. I didn't play bridge at that time, and and I'd, I'd watch sometimes, but. Uh, so I, I didn't go to the dances and things. Some of the GIs went to the dances and, and uh, uh, movies and stuff like that. I guess I occasionally went to a movie. Uh, the reason I say that it's absolutely necessary that the Beta 3 building be included in the, uh, the tours of Y-12 as part of the park is because the basic of the whole thing is the miracle project. And starting from, it was a miracle to be able to design and operate the Calutron on the basis of the little information that was available from the Cyclotron, to the miracle of building all these buildings, huge buildings, in not much over a year. And having them in operation, it was a miracle we were able to get enough uranium at the time we did, because several months later it would not have been able to be used. You don't can't get a uh, and all this was a, occurred because of these what went out of these huge buildings, and there's no way to get a feel for that unless you're in one of them. 
I mean, once you're in one, you can begin to visualize all this. The next building is like that, and the next building is like that. But without building the beta three, there's no way to give that feeling of the enormity of the project. So that's why I say that building, if it's not good, it substantially almost eliminates the white 12 story in my estimation. <laughs>